and I are a hearty people. <laughs> God bless you. A few miles from where I grew up, there's a large cemetery. There are thousands buried there on those beautiful green rolling hills. But my interest in that particular cemetery is because my grandmother is buried there, uh, buried in 1978, and uh, a little cousin that I never met. And just a few feet away from, from that is my mother and my father's grave, buried in 1994 and 2011. And I'm sure this is the case with everybody here that there is a cemetery or maybe more than one that is particularly special to you. Everywhere around the world that you go, you'll find the tombs of the dead. It already was mentioned in Egypt, the pyramids, they're probably the greatest tombs ever constructed. And we think of other places, famous burial places, Gettysburg, Flanders Fields, Normandy, Arlington National, and those rows of crosses. Christianity says, of all the people who ever died, Jesus of Nazareth is the most significant. We have four books in the New Testament. We call them Gospels. And they tell us about the death of Jesus. They record the central event of all human history. Go into almost any museum in the Western world and you will find paintings depicting this event, especially and usually by the great masters of art. No death has been more studied, more debated, more analyzed, more often told about than the death of the Messiah. And Christians say it's the most significant event in the history of the world. Why is that? Why is this death so important? Why do Christians spend so much time on it? Indeed, why do Christians hang an instrument of torture across on the front of their buildings and sometimes around their necks and even incise it upon their skin. Now, there have been a lot of responses to the death of Jesus down through the centuries. Many have laughed at it, ridiculed it, but some have submitted to it. And some are convinced that this death is the central event of all history. The death of the Messiah is unique and unusual. There are some reasons why. It's unusual, first of all, because it was a voluntary death. Now, there are others that have went to death as volunteers, but not many. Jesus said in John 10, 18, I lay down my life. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. Jesus in the Gospels, he voluntarily heads toward Jerusalem, even though he knows that trouble awaits him. It is a voluntary death. It's also a death that, that's predicted. Other deaths have been predicted, but none so well as Jesus's. Jesus himself predicted it several times. Mark chapter 10, verses 33 and 34, he says to the disciples, We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. But even before he was born, several hundred years before he was born, the prophets predicted his death, Isaiah most memorably does so in chapter 53 of his prophecy. He vividly describes Jesus' death 700 years before it occurred. And so his death was predicted. It's also unique because it was painful. Now that's 
Uh, to say, of course, that that other deaths are not painful, they most certainly are, but historians of the period say that crucifixion was a horrible, excruciating way to die. In fact, the word excruciating itself derives from the word cross. Jesus hung on the cross for six hours, barely clothed, if at all. Everyone could see his suffering. Death was voluntary, it was predicted, it was painful. But I want to mention just three other reasons that the Bible teaches that this death is so significant. First, the death of the Messiah is significant because it is the death of God, the very Son of God. When you read through the Gospels, you'll be introduced to a person who made absolutely incredible claims. He did some awesome deeds, and he said some marvelous words. If you think of it for a minute, he, he claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be the Creator, the Lord of Lords, the Savior. He even claimed to be God. And so incredible claims. And then his deeds... He healed the blind. He, he caused the lame to walk. He even raised the dead. Awesome deeds. And his words. Blessed are the poor. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son that who, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. So incredible claims, awesome deeds, marvelous words. What are we to make of this, this person, Jesus? Now people have, have basically taken some version of one of three positions in reference to Jesus. Some have thought that he was a liar or perhaps that others told lies about him. It was all made up. He performed tricks. Uh, he fabricated words. And yet to believe he was a liar is almost more difficult to believe than that he was who he said he was. Because if he was a liar, then he pulled off the biggest hoax in all human history, a hoax for which thousands and thousands have given their lives. If he was a liar, he has fooled the world for over 2,000 years. Another position is to say that he was crazy, that he was deluded. He wasn't who he said he was. He was confused. He maybe was even deranged. And so were all his followers. Maybe his disciples were using this poor, deluded man to accomplish their goals in life. And yet again, this option makes even less sense to me. How can we believe that by trickery, a, a deluded man started the largest peaceful revolution in history? This doesn't make sense. So if he wasn't a liar and if he wasn't crazy, there's one option left. He must be the Lord of life. And if Jesus is Lord, that means that the Son of God dies at the cross. That God leaves his throne in heaven. He comes to earth and he dies for human sins. Second, the death of Messiah is significant because it is a death in our place. You ever wonder, and I'm sure you do, why the world is in the mess it's in? Why so much violence? Why so much hatred? So much war and perversion and inhumanity? The Bible answers this throughout the New Testament. One really good place to read the answer is the first six chapters of the letter to the Romans. It says that the basic human problem is sin 
that that's the cause of all the bad stuff. It also says that there's nothing we in and of ourselves can do about it, that we're trapped by it, we're enslaved by it, we can't stop it. And finally it says that Jesus came to rescue us from, from these problems. So the New Testament uses many metaphors to describe what Jesus did. It says, we were in a great battle that we were losing and Jesus came and gave us the victory. It says that we committed a crime. We were convicted of that crime and Jesus came and took our punishment for that crime. It says that we had a relationship with God that broke apart and Jesus came and reconciled it. It says that we were in slavery to sin. Jesus came and bought us out of that. All these metaphors of what Christ has done. Jesus, the one completely innocent, perfect person to ever live. And he was perfect. Hung on a cross in place of us all. In place of us guilty people. There's no Greek myth about a man named Hippolytus. Hippolytus fell in love with a goddess. Her name was Artemis. And he became her devoted follower. She became his lover. And there's this great battle in which Hippolytus is gravely wounded and he, he lies dying on the battlefield. And Artemis comes down from the heavens and she talks to her, her human lover. And then she turns around and goes back to heaven. And Hippolytus dies on that battlefield alone. Christianity is the exact opposite of that pagan story. We're mortally wounded. We're dying. And our God comes down in the form of Jesus. And instead of us dying, he dies in our place. And last, the death of the Messiah is significant because it is not the end. And that cemetery that I mentioned at the beginning, there's, there's really just one reason that I'm interested in it. And that's because I know that the earthly remains of, of those that I loved most in this world are there. Everybody who has died is buried somewhere. Even those that Jesus, while he was here, rose up from the dead, they, they died again. They're buried somewhere. And, and we could find the burial places, frankly, of all those who have started various religious movements through history. There is only one empty tomb, truly empty, in this world. Af after he died... His followers went to the place where they had laid his body. They were greeted by an angel. You remember what the angel said? Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. He was dead, buried in the tomb, but death couldn't hold him. He rose up and he lives. The resurrection has powered the Christian movement for 21 centuries. It will continue to do so as long as the world stands. And the resurrection makes us look at our own death. You know, if he died and he was raised to new life, then we in Christ have that hope too. That is part of what we will be. There was a book written years ago by Patrick Morley called Man in the Mirror. He tells about a group of fishermen who landed in this secluded area, this bay in Alaska. Had a great day fishing. 
for salmon. But when they came back to their landing site, their, their seaplane, uh, it had run aground because of the tides fluctuating and they had no option except to wait until the next morning when the tides came in. They took off the next morning but only got a few feet off the ground and then crashed down into the sea. When the plane was aground the previous day, one of the pontoons had been punctured. It had filled up with water. It was too heavy for them to take flight. So the seaplane began slowly to sink. Three men in the plane and one 12 year old boy. And they prayed together and then they all jumped into the icy waters to swim to shore. Water was cold. There was a strong riptide. And two of the men reached shore exhausted totally. They looked back and their companion, who was also a very strong swimmer, was not swimming to shore and did not swim to shore because his 12-year-old son wasn't strong enough to make it. They saw his father with his arms around his son being swept out to sea. He chose to die with his son rather than to live without him. I think most parents love their children so much that they would die for them. I know I do. And that's the way it should be. But even that doesn't touch the love of God in Christ. Why? Because God in Christ didn't just come to die with us. He came and died for us in our place. So instead of the story ending in sadness and defeat, it ends in victory. And so the cross of Christ is significant because it is the death of the Son of God. It is a death in our place, and it is not the end. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Our closing song before the, our last song before the closing prayer will be This World Is Not My Home. And if you're able, can you please stand with me for this one? This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore just up in glory land we'll live eternally the saints on every hand are shouting victory their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore and I can't feel at home in this world anymore oh Lord you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Maybe sit it.
if you'd all bow with me. Father in heaven, praise your name. Thank you so much for everything that you give us daily and for giving us your son who sacrificed himself so that we might live. Thank you, God, so much for this weather, even though it's rained a little bit. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to come out and uh, give glory to you and worship you this morning. God, I want to pray for the people who are not able to be with us, to join us this morning, that you give them strength and help them to recover, whether that may be physically or mentally, that they would be able to join us on Sunday or that they would be able to still give glory to you. Help us, God, to grow as people and as Christians this week and to give glory to you through everything that we do. And in your son's name we pray. Amen.